This is From His Heart, and we're in a new extensive series from Pastor Jeff called The Walk, Learning to Take God at His Word. In this lesson, you'll learn the pitfalls of living by sight and not by faith, and discover the power of a faith that trusts God completely. It's a message called Faith Versus Sight. Now, in the Christian life, it begins with faith. The Bible clearly says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith. It's not by works, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. It's God's grace and our faith in God's grace that produces eternal life that causes us to be born again. The Christian life begins with faith. The Christian life continues with faith. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the apostle Paul said to the Christians in Colossae, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You receive him by faith, you walk in him by faith. It's faith all the way. That's the way God set up the Christian life. Now, we walk by faith, not by sight. In everybody's, every Christian's life, we struggle between walking by faith and walking by sight. There is always a struggle there. Nobody gets to the place where you don't struggle with sight because sight is very readily there. I mean, we all see uh, the things around us. We all see the, the obstacles and the difficulties and the problems. It's very easy to see those things. You know, when Moses killed the Egyptian, the Bible says before he killed him, he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he didn't see anyone, he killed him and buried him in the sand. He failed to look up. He didn't look that way. And, and when you and I struggle with faith and sight, we're looking this way and that way. We're looking at this problem and that problem and what's coming down the pike. And we fail to look up and we fail to factor in God. Now, that's a challenge for me. That's a challenge for you. That's a challenge for everyone. It was a challenge for the Apostle Paul. We walk by faith and not by sight. And every day, we have a choice. Are we going to walk by faith or are we going to walk by sight? Now, if you want to please God, the Bible makes it clear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. If you want to please God, the only way to please him is to walk by faith, not by sight. And if you want to experience God doing great things in and through your life, you have to walk by faith. So today, what we want to do in our series, we want to place faith and sight and pit them against one another and show you the difference between the walk of faith and the walk of sight. And to do that, we want to look at a really interesting story in 2 Kings chapter 6. I love the stories in the Old Testament because they illustrate so beautifully truths throughout the Bible, but truths especially in the New Testament. And so many people don't uh, spend much time in the Old Testament, so when you tell them stories out of the Old Testament, they're like, man, that's a cool story. Where'd you get that one? It's right here in God's Word. So today we're going to learn a really cool story that happened around the middle part of the 800s B.C. Elisha was the prophet. He was the man of God in Israel. Ahab's son, Jehoram, is king. He also went by another name, Joram. So anytime you run across his name, Jehoram or Joram, it's talking about the same person. And they had an enemy coming against them, and the enemy was, were the Arameans from Syria, and their king was Ben-Hadad II. Anytime you run across somebody that's been something something, uh, that just means son of. So Ben-Hadad was the son of Hadad, and there was a Ben-Hadad the first. He was senior, and then you have the son, Ben-Hadad Jr., but they called him Ben-Hadad the second, and those are the players as we read in 2 Kings chapter 6. Here's what the scripture says, starting in verse 24. Now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, 
gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Samaria is the capital city of Israel, of the northern kingdom of Israel. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's two pounds of silver. And a fourth of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. A cup of dove's dung was two ounces of silver. I wouldn't think that would be a big seller, but that was what was going on in Israel. It says in verse 26, and as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord, if Yahweh does not help you, from where shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? There wasn't any food around. Verse 28, and the king said to her, what is the matter with you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. And it came about when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth, burlap beneath on his body. Then he said, may God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer, Joram was the son of Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel murdered Naboth for his vineyard. Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door and shut it against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? The king is coming right behind him. Verse 33, and while he was still speaking with them, behold, the messenger came down to him and he said, behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Faith versus Sight. Such a beautiful picture in this passage of faith versus sight. Now, I want you to notice with me four key differences between walking by faith and walking by sight. Difference number one, faith sees opportunity. Sight sees doom. Faith sees opportunity and sight sees doom. Here's the story. You have the king of the Arameans, Ben-Hadad II, and he leads his troops to surround the city of Samaria, to besiege the city. Now, when you besiege the city, that means that you cordoned off the city with your armies so that no one could get in the city and no one could come out of the city without going through your armies and without being killed. And when you besiege a city, you basically starve that city out. Because if nobody can go in and nobody can come out, uh, eventually the food supply runs out. And when the food supply runs out, the people get desperate. And, and that was what was happening in Israel. You know, it's supply and demand. When there is no supply, the demand goes way up and the prices go way up. And people were giving five pounds of silver for a donkey's head. If you've ever really looked at a donkey's head, there's not a lot of meat on the bone there. There's not a lot to eat there. But you'd rather have a donkey's head than a cup of dove's dung. And they were given two pounds of silver for that. It's like, good night. This is horrible, horrible what's going on in Israel. And to make matters worse, then you had this woman who actually boiled her baby and she and the other woman ate the baby. And she's thinking, well, we'll boil my son today, but tomorrow we'll have your son. And the woman hid her son. And so this woman who lost her son, who ate her son and lost her son because he was now eaten, uh, she's upset. I mean, times are bad in Israel. Faith sees that times are bad, and sight sees that times are bad. What does that say to us today? Hey, circumstances can sometimes get really difficult in life. No doubt they were experiencing really difficult circumstances in life. Really difficult circumstances. I mean, no matter what you're facing today, 
I think we'd all have to admit it's not as bad as somebody boiling her son and eating him. I mean, that's just beyond comprehension uh, in terms of wickedness and depravity. How could you possibly do that? And you know what's interesting is God had told them hundreds of years before that through Moses in Leviticus chapter 26, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. He said, this is what's gonna happen to you. If you disobey me, if you go serve other gods, then I'm gonna send an army against you and they're gonna uh, surround you and they're gonna starve you out and you people will even eat your own children. And that's exactly what they did. Well, situations, the situation is bad. And maybe you're here today and you say, man, my situation is bad. Maybe you've never been here before, but your situation is so bad that you're saying, I'm gonna go to church because maybe God has an answer for me. I don't know what else to do because things are so bad. Maybe you have a physical problem or maybe you have a financial problem or maybe you have a family problem or maybe it's an emotional problem or uh, some kind of spiritual problem, but you have something and it just seems to go from bad to worse. You know, it's bad when you're eating a donkey's head and you wash it down with a cup of dove's dung, but it's even worse when you hear that a woman boiled her son and ate him and the king tears his clothes. It's horrible. It's horrible. And both faith and sight recognize, hey, circumstances are bad. But now for the, the people who walk by sight, the common response to bad circumstances is anger and to get angry at God. That's the common response. So here is the king, Jehoram or Joram, whatever you want to call him, the same guy. Here's the king, and he hears the situation from the woman, and he tears his clothes. Now, normally that was a sign of tremendous grief. In his case, it's a sign of grief mixed with lots of anger. They said that he was wearing sackcloth. They could see that he was wearing sackcloth under his clothes. Normally, you put on sackcloth when you were humbling yourself before God, when you, it's a sign of repentance, but this guy wasn't repentant at all. Remember, his mom and dad were Ahab and Jezebel, and they were the most wicked uh, king and queen ever uh, that, that Israel had ever experienced. And that's the family he grew up in, and he's a pagan to the core, and so he's not uh, wearing sackcloth to show that his heart was broken before God. He's just putting on, he's doing whatever. It's like, this is really bad. Maybe I'll put on sackcloth. Maybe that'll do something. He's like, like a lucky rabbit's foot or something. So he tears his clothes, and he says these words, May God, verse 31, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. I'm gonna cut off his head. Now, he's mad at God. He says to the woman, what am I supposed to do? God, Yahweh, the Lord, anytime you see Lord all in caps, it's, it's the name Yahweh, the God's covenant name, God's personal name, Y-H-W-H. -H. He said, if, if the personal God Yahweh, your God Yahweh doesn't take care of us, if he's not filling up the, the wine press with grapes, if he doesn't have any grain in the, in the threshing floor, if there's nothing to eat, what are you looking at? What am I supposed to do? It's God's fault that we don't have uh, provision. It's God's fault that this army is besieging us. Blames God. So I'm mad at God because this is the situation I'm in, and instead of humbling myself before God, I get angry at God. And how do I get back at God? What do I do to get at God? Well, I'll, I'll kill God's man. I'll kill Elisha the prophet. Now, his dad, Ahab, did something similar when it came to Elisha's mentor. Elisha's mentor was Elijah with a J. Sometimes you get those confused because they sound so much alike. Elijah and Elisha. Well, Elijah was the prophet when Ahab was king. And uh, Ahab got so mad at Elijah. And when they finally met, he said, is it you, you troubler of Israel? That's what he called Elijah, God's man. And Elijah said, I'm not the troubler of Israel. You are. You and your wicked family. You are the ones who are troubling Israel. It's because of your sin that there is a famine in the land because they were experiencing famine during the days of Ahab too. So here is the son, 
Ahab's son, Jehoram, and he says to Elisha, you're the troubler of Israel. I'm going to cut off your head. But here's the thing about Elisha. God spoke to Elisha. God revealed things to Elisha. So it's hard to, to sneak up on the guy. Because every time people tried to sneak up on him, the Lord would say, hey, so-and-so is coming up. Uh, he's getting ready to sneak up on you, so be ready. So he knew, that, hey, the messenger's coming, the king's coming, and they're coming to take off your head. And it says this in the Good News Bible, verse 33. The king arrived and said, it's the Lord who has brought this trouble upon us. Why should I wait any longer for him to do something? He was mad at God. Not wait. We just sang that song, Waiting Here for You. Well, uh, uh, Joram says, I ain't waiting for Yahweh anymore. He's causing all the problem. I'd really just like to get on with killing you, Elisha. So that is the situation. The common response to difficulties from sight dwellers is to look at all the situation. You get upset about the situation. You get mad at God. You lash out at somebody who represents God. And you don't do what you need to do, which is to humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. But see, what does a faith person do? What does someone who walks by faith do? He says this, the greater the difficulty, the greater the opportunity. The greater the difficulty, the greater the opportunity for God to do something big. Because I have a big problem. And so the bigger the problem, the bigger the miracle. That's what a person who walks by faith, who's constantly looking up and factoring God into every situation in life. Faith sees the opportunity. Sight sees the doom. Second difference. Faith believes the word of God and sight mocks the word of God. So here you have the king, and he is there at Elisha's place. And chapter 7, verse 1 says this. Then Elisha said, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, tomorrow, about this time, a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Tomorrow, about this time, no more famine. No more famine. The prices are going down. And you can get seven quarts of fine flour. That's what a measure was. Seven quarts of fine flour for a shekel. For 0.4 ounces of silver. And 14 quarts of barley for 0.4 ounces of silver. Nobody's going to be eating dove's dung and cow's head anymore. And it's going to happen tomorrow at about this time. The waiting is getting ready to be over. Verse 2, And the royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, with a sneer, I might add, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Then Elisha said, Behold, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Faith believes the word. Doubt or sight mocks the word. Elisha gave the word, and what did the royal officer do? He laughed. He mocked. He sneered. Ha, ha, that is impossible. How could that happen? Do you, know, do you not see the situation? Elisha knew the situation. See, when you walk by faith, it doesn't mean you gouge out your eyes and you don't know what the circumstances are. You don't know what the difficulty is. You know what the difficulty is. Elijah knew the difficulty. But Elisha factored it in God and this king's royal officer. He didn't. And when he even thought, when he heard the word, he's like, ah, that no way. I mean, he was a big guy that said, no way, Jose, could that ever happen? If you've ever played golf, at Texarkana Country Club on one of the par fives when you hit your second shot. You know, they have the yardage there that shows you how far away you are from the hole. And you know, you're, you're 185 yards out. You're 200 yards out. You're 210 yards out. They have one uh, sprinkler head that just says, no way, Jose. <laughs> I don't care how strong you are, how big of a hitter you are. You ain't getting there from here. You're too far away. 
You should have thought about that on your drive. You know, you had a wimpy drive, and so no way, Jose. Well, that's the king's officer is a no way, Jose guy. There is no way, Jose, that God could do that. It is impossible for that to happen. That's what sight says. And you know what's interesting? Sight is right. Sight is right. It is impossible. It is impossible. The promises of God are impossible. If they weren't impossible, then what would you need God for? George Mueller, that great man of faith, he said this. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. And Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but with, not with God, for all things are possible with God. What are you facing today? Do you face something that's impossible? Did you get a report back from the doctor and they said there's nothing we can do? Hey, with man it's impossible, but not with God. Because with God, all things are possible. No matter what you're facing today, God is able. Now to him, the scripture says, who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory. God is able. I remember a little over 10 years ago when I started uh, the Lord led me to start from his heart ministries. I was all excited. We got started. There were two people who gave me unsolicited money, and it totaled $35,000 to get the, the radio and television ministry off the ground. And so I had enough money to pay for one year of broadcasting on FamilyNet TV, which is a very small station, but it was in a, a number of cities, smaller towns around the nation. And then I had enough money left over to, to produce a website, small one, for like $500. And I thought I was in pretty good shape. $35,000, it's enough to cover me for one year. And there's enough to pay my salary of zero. So here we go. We're, we're, we're getting started. And I went to my first National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Los Angeles in 2000, February of 2005. And I remember I sat down with a friend of mine, Carl Townsend, who was kind of helping me. And uh, as I started to, to get uh, to know a little bit about how this worked, I was like, I don't know if my 35,000 is quite enough. And so I asked Carl, I said, Carl, how much money am I going to need to really get this off the ground? He said, oh, you, well, you're going to need about $500,000. I said, how, how much? He said, 500000 I said, well, I thought you said 500000 but that can't be much. I have 35000 How far does that get me? He said, I got to go. I mean, it was that kind of a deal. It was like, why am I even talking to you? You don't have any money. You're not going anywhere with $35,000. So it's $500,000. Well, it might have as well have been $500 million because I didn't have anything like that, and I didn't see how anything like that could happen. And right off the bat, I was thinking, well, I just ought to shut this down. This is, this is impossible. And so I was living in the realm of this is impossible, and the Lord really convicted my heart. He said, yeah, it's impossible for you. It's not impossible for me. $500,000 might be a whole lot for you. What is it to me? All the silver, all the gold belong to me, God says. So, Jeff, why don't you just start looking up? Why don't you start trusting me? See, it is impossible, and it was impossible to me, but it's not impossible to God. And here's the beautiful thing about impossible. Impossible is I'm possible with God. Whatever you're facing that's an impossible, that is just I'm possible with God. Because just as Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, the royal officer is a key person in this story. He is really, he becomes the poster child of a person who walks by sight. He's the poster child of no way, Jose. He calls God out. He literally calls God a liar. When Elijah gives the word of the Lord, this is what's going to happen. He says, no way can God do that. God doesn't have the power to do that. If he made windows in heaven, that couldn't happen. And Elisha said, all right. 
out of your own mouth. You'll see it happen, but you're not going to experience any of it. You're not going to get to taste any of it because something's getting ready to happen to you. Keep that in mind. It's dangerous ground to walk by sight, dangerous ground to mock the word of God, to call God a liar, to look at God and say, God, you are powerless in this situation. God is omnipotent God. He can do anything. Behold, uh, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, is anything too difficult for me? And the answer is no. God, you can do anything. Faith believes the word. Sight mocks the word. Difference number three, faith takes a step and sight stays seated. Now, the scene shifts goes away from Elisha and the king and the royal officer, and it shifts, verse 3, to four lepers. It says in verse 3, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, the gate of Samaria, and they said to one another, Why do we sit here until we die? They, they were starving to death just like everybody else. If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we're going to die here also. We can sit at the gate, but we're going to die at the gate. We can go into the city, but we're going to die in the city. to die of starvation. He said, now therefore come and let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we shall live. And if they kill us, well, we shall die, but we're going to die anyway. So what difference does it make? Verse 5, and they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. When they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp just as it was, and fled for their lives. The Bible says the wicked flee when no one is pursuing Verse 8, when the lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried from there silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid them. Now they said to one another, we are not doing right, for this day is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Four lepers that leave where they are, they take some steps to go outside the camp of the Israelites, the city of Samaria, and they say, you know what? Hey, we, we might die going here, but we know for sure we're going to die staying st standing still, just sitting there, and we need to take steps uh, to, to see if they, they'll have mercy on us. But when they went out there, they found that the Arameans were gone. Well, they didn't know that. Nobody in, his, in, in Samaria knew that. Why? Because they're hunkered down, saying the enemy's out there, and the enemy's going to get us, and, and we're just uh, waiting for God to do something, and, and God isn't doing anything. Hey, faith takes a step, and sight stays seated. Now, these lepers... No indication that they had, uh, they heard this word from Elisha, but they're illustrative of what faith is all about. Faith isn't just hunkering down. Faith is stepping out and believing God and moving in the direction that you need to go. Faith always has legs. It always has legs. Doesn't just sit there. We sing that song, uh, standing on the promises of Christ my King. But many of us aren't standing on the promises. We're just sitting on the premises. And we're just kind of sitting here, you know, sitting on the pew. And just, well, I'm just waiting for God to do something. And God says, well, get up. You want to see me do something? Take a step of faith. See, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, it's worth repeating. It's worth you writing it in your Bible. It's worth you uh, having a tattoo. I'm not for tattoos, but this would be a good one. God will not do what you can do, and you cannot do what he can do. God will not do what you can do, and you cannot do what he can do, and faith always takes a step toward God. And when faith takes a step toward God, God begins to work and God begins to move. You look at the miracles of Jesus, 
How did they take place? They took place when people took a step of faith. Ten lepers cried out to Jesus. They cried out for healing. And Jesus said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible says, and as they were going, they were cleansed of their leprosy. As they were going. Not when Jesus said it, when they believed what he said, and they started out to show themselves to the priests, and they noticed, hey, as they were going, they were cleansed. Jesus came to that man who had the withered hand. And he said, stretch out your hand. And the guy could have said, well, I can't stretch out my hand. My hand's withered. Can't you see that, Jesus? But Jesus said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand. And when he did, he was healed. Jesus said at the wedding feast of Cana of Galilee, they ran out of wine. And Mary said to him, they have no wine. And he said, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And she looked at the servants and she said, whatever he says to you, do it. And so he said, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them with water. Draw some out and give it to the head waiter. And when they drew it out and gave it to the head waiter, the water became wine. How did that happen? Jesus didn't go fill the water pots. God will not do what you can do, and you cannot do what he can do. The Lord responds to our faith. Jesus said to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, roll away the stone. She said, Lord, we don't want to roll away the stone. He stinks. He's been dead for four days. Jesus said, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And if you don't, you won't roll away the stone. He wasn't going to roll away the stone. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. God will not do what you can do, and you cannot do what he can do. Faith requires action. It requires action. I heard about a pastor. And he was in financial need. And uh, his financial need was $5,000. And he heard about a raffle that was going on in his community. And first prize at the raffle was $5,000. He said, God, that's what I need. And he began to pray. And he said, oh, God, oh, God, that raffle. Let me win that raffle. And he prayed one day, two days, three days, same thing. Oh, God, just show up and show out and let me win that raffle. Lord, you know my need. I have a need for $5,000. It's $5,000. Oh, God, please let me win that raffle. And he prayed and prayed and nothing was happening. And he came before the Lord. He said, Lord, I don't understand it. You're not answering my prayer. I need that $5,000. And God spoke so clearly to his heart and said, hey, pastor, buy a ticket. <laughs> you know, we expect God to do everything. And God is waiting on us to take a step. He's like, hey, I'm not doing this unless you believe me enough to take a step in that direction. In the book, or in the movie, Facing the Giants, the preacher comes to the football coach and his team is doing so poorly and he tells him about two farmers. And in the story, he says, you know, these two farmers were praying for rain. And he said, uh, one farmer prayed for rain. The other farmer prayed for rain. One planted his crops and the other didn't. He said, who believed that God was going to send rain? He said, well, I guess the guy who planted his crops. Yeah, yeah. Faith always has legs on it. And when faith requires action, now God did something great. I mean, it was un unheard of, unbelievable that these Arameans would be scared out of their minds to leave all their stuff and just flee. How, how does that happen? The Lord has to put terror in a man's heart to do that. You and I can't do that. We can't do what God can do. But the lepers had to leave. They had to take a step of faith. They could have died. And they said, I might die. Remember I told you at the start of this series, it is better to die in faith than to live in doubt. It's better to die in faith than to live in doubt. Listen, if I was told that I had six months to live and there's nothing that the doctors can do, I would believe God to heal me until he told me I'm not, I'm gonna heal you in heaven, or until uh, I died. But I would just die in faith. So much better to die in faith than to live in doubt. And that's what these guys did. They just said, we're gonna go out there. Now, the contrast, sight. Sight argues to stay seated even in the face of evidence. Here, here are the four lepers. 
Man, they're, they're, they were starving to death like everybody else, but man, they go to this tent and then they're eating and they're drinking and they're taking uh, silver and gold and they're burying it and it's like, man, clothes, they, all this stuff. It's like, this is awesome. And there's nobody around and there's tent after tent after tent. There's a big quadrant of, um, of soldiers that left their stuff. It was all around the city. And so it's like, wait a minute, this isn't right. This isn't just, God didn't do this for just us four. We need to tell the king. We need to tell the people. And so they go back and tell the king. And listen to Jehoram, Joram, listen to his response, verse 12. Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have gone out from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall capture, capture them alive and get into the city. This is a trap. Let's just continue to stay seated. Good night. That guy, the king, he heard the word from Elisha. He heard that the famine was going to be over about this time tomorrow. And now he has evidence from the four lepers who come back. Incidentally, God uses the, the small and the outcasts to bring the good news, just like he came first to the shepherds to say, hey, the king is born. And the shepherds were the ones that got to experience that. So he uses these four lepers and they bring the news and it confirms the word that I, Elisha had given him, and the king still doesn't believe it. Ah, it's a trap. They're trying to trap me. Sight argues for inaction, even in the face of evidence. Sight wants you to just continue to sit on your biscuit, being too afraid to risk it, Hey, when we give the invitation in just a moment and I call you to make a decision for Christ to come and, and link up with our church and make this a church home to follow the Lord in baptism, to get involved in a small group, to start honoring the Lord from your wealth, to take that next step of faith, whatever it is that God is tugging on your heart to do, and you're just like, mm, no, I don't know. I think I'm just going to sit here a little longer. You know, because... I'm just going to have to, you know, check this out a little more. I just have to see a little more. Well, you have all this evidence. You have people around you, and God is doing great things in, in, in other people's lives. Well, I just don't know for me. And you just won't take that step of faith. You're just like the king, the faithless king in Israel. Hey, how does God feel about it when he comes with a great miracle, when you hear what the Lord is doing and you still want to sit on the premises? You know, they did that in the book of Numbers when God had made the way for them to go into the promised land the very first time when they were camped at Kadesh Barnea. They had been out of Egypt for about a year and a half. They had gotten the Ten Commandments, and now God says, we're ready to move into the promised land. But they spied out the land, the 12 spies, 10 faithless spies, two faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb, and they came back after 40 days of spying out the land, and they said, well, the land's good land. Yeah, God wasn't lying about the land being filled with milk and honey. But let me tell you something about the land. There are giants in that land. And there's no way we can go up against the giants because they're just going to, we're like grasshoppers. They're like giants. And Joshua and Caleb said, hey, by all means, we should go up and fight them because God has given us the land. But the people said, uh-uh, we're not going. We're, there's no way we can go. And then they got mad at God. And what did they want to do? They wanted to kill Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. They, let's, we can't attack God, so let's kill God's people. Let's appoint a new leader. And let's go back to Egypt. And God showed up. And God was ticked off. And God says in Numbers Chapter 14, verse 11, how long will this people spurn me and how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? And God told Moses, get out of the way, Moses. I'm gonna wipe them out. Moses interceded for the people. God was gonna destroy them all. God was angry with the people. Why will you not believe me, God says? You've seen me do so much. You've seen me part the Red Sea. You've seen me bring the plagues on the Egyptians. You've seen me rain down manna upon you. You've seen all this, and yet you still refuse to believe me. Some of you are here, and you're like that. 
You're just like that. You're just still, well, I just still need to evaluate. Well, what else do you need? Faith takes a step. Sight stays seated. And difference number four, faith enjoys the victory and sight gets trampled. Verse 13. The king says, well, we shouldn't go because, you know, it's a trap. Verse 13, and one of the servants answered and said, please, let, let, let some men take five of the horses which remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who are left in it. I mean, we're all gonna die here, king. Let's at least go out and check it out. And he says, verse 14, they took therefore two chariots with horses and the king sent after the army of the Arameans saying, go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of fine flour, watch this, a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord that he had given 24 hours previous through Elisha the prophet. Now the king appointed the royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled on him at the gate and he died just as the man of God had said who spoke when the king came down to him. Hey, you walk by faith and you get to experience the blessings of God, the victory of God, the abundance of God, the goodness of God. But if you walk by sight, you're gonna be like that royal officer. You're gonna see what the Lord is doing to other people, but you're not gonna experience it. And when he heard, wow, this happened just like, uh, just like Elisha said, and here I am, uh, no way Jose, and okay, let me open up the gate. And they just flooded to get the food and trampled him, and he was dead. That's what happens when you mock the word of God. That's what happens when you call God a liar. That's what happens when you say, God, you're too puny, you're too powerless to do something in this situation. Then that miracle passes you by. You don't want to be like that. You want to be a person who gets in on what God wants to do because God's a good God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God for the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And God says, I have good things for you. Now watch, if you don't take a step of faith, if the lepers had just said, well, I don't think, I don't think it's gonna happen. Let's just all hunker down. Let's just sit here. We're just waiting for you, God, to do something. And God's saying, you need to get out there. You need to take a step of faith. Some of you might be looking for a job. Well, I'm just, I'm just waiting for the phone to ring. Well, have you sent anybody your resume? Well, no, just waiting for them to find me. You know, you're like the pastors, right? buy a raffle ticket. I mean, you do something. God will not do what you can do. You cannot do what he can do. And when you take that step of faith, you experience the victory. When you say, listen, I know this is impossible, but impossible is I'm possible with God. And God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to believe you. And even if it doesn't work out, because nobody bats a thousand, nobody gets it all right. Nobody always understands everything that God is doing. We can miss it on a situation. But you say, God, I'm missing by faith. I'm trusting you by faith. And if you want to do something else, then that's, that's in your prerogative to do. You're God. I'm just going to follow you. But when you have that kind of heart, then God loves to work in that kind of heart, in that person's life. My sister, Val, is a couple years older than me. And uh, the Lord has done such a great work in her life in the last several years. And she watches us uh, every Sunday, live stream. She's watching now. And uh, I got her permission to share this story. But when we were doing the money series, uh, God really spoke to her heart because she doesn't have a lot of money and she has uh, a lot of medical issues. She doesn't make very much money. And so money is something that was really uh, uh, an issue for her. And so she, she would really watch her bank account tight and she would get nervous about her money. Well, during the money series... We talked about how you can't put your faith and trust in money. You put your faith in God who provides for his children. And 
it clicked in her heart and she saw, hey, I'm, I've been trusting in this, my bank account, which doesn't have much in it. I need to trust in God. And she began to trust in the Lord and she began to give even when it's, you know, uh, just common sense would say, no, no, you can't, you can't tithe, you can't do that because you gotta hold on to it. And she said, I've been set free. And she says, this is just awesome. This is wonderful. God provides for me. Well, she sent me this just the other day. She said, guess what? I am so excited that I'm grasping for the right words. I have been trusting God, giving more than 10% of my tithe, and things have really been great. I have had more work, and I can see God working in my financial life. She said, yesterday, I got a check from a guy in our family and a note. He said he hadn't felt right about taking the $4,300 from me. He had helped her with her taxes, and then she had paid him back. And he said, I didn't feel right about you paying me back. And he said that he had prayed about it and decided to return it to her and that it wasn't up for discussion. She said, wow, when God shows up. She said, I'm so excited, not about the money, just about what happened. She said, the night before, I had tithed double on a check for $500. Then the next day, I get a check that doubled my savings account. I just can feel his love surrounding me. It's awesome. Amen. Thanks for your part in all of this. She is taking steps of faith, and God is blessing her in that. And God will do the same for you. There's a story about, true story, about the animal called the African impala. The African impala is a, a really cool animal, an animal that can leap up to 30 feet. It can jump 10 feet. So it can go up 10 feet. It can go out, broad jump, 30 feet. If you ever watch uh, on National Geographic or something, those things are amazing. You know, the lions are always going after the impala, but they're amazing creatures. But you know, you can take an African impala and you can put it in the zoo and you can put up a three-foot wall and the impala will never jump out. It can go 10 feet and go out 30 feet. It could jump out any time it wanted to, but you know why it doesn't? Because the African impala will not jump unless it can see where its feet are going to land. Some of you are like that. You're living inside this small space and you could get out, but you're like, oh, I don't, I, know, I, I don't, can't see what is over there and so I better just play it close to the vest. Sight sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Sight sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Sight dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Sight questions who believe. Faith replies, I. The Christian life is a life of faith. We walk with the Lord by faith and we enter into a relationship with Him by faith. Listen, I don't know where you are spiritually, but God does. And perhaps you're watching today and and you feel distant from God, you don't have to be. You can today put your faith and trust in the risen Savior, and you can take your puny little hand of faith and put it in his great big hand of grace and experience a transformation on the inside that makes its way to the outside. Listen, you can pray this prayer with me and come to know Jesus in a real and personal way. Just say from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and life. Forgive me of my sins. Change me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender all to you, and I want you to be my Lord and my Savior, and I commit to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer from your heart and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, 
to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on the screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.